Poverty is not just the absence of money, but the absence of opportunity. And the United States is a country where you have both freedom and abundant opportunities. I'm moving to the United States as giving me both. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. I came from a close-knitted family. I was the third of four children. And the best thing that my parents gave me was the gift of education. Even though I came from a poor family, they gave me education with the instruction that this is the tool that will help me to dig my way out of poverty and ignorance. But what my parents did was that they instilled in us the value of faith, hard work, and not giving up. They made us realize that if you put in the work, you will definitely get the reward. I came without a dime in my pocket. All I had were big dreams, determination to succeed, and the resilience. I got my first job at the age of 14. My job was on the construction site. My duties were to move concrete on a large pan from one end of the construction site to another one. I worked on that day from around six in the morning to about seven at night. At the end of the day, the employer refused to pay me. And our reason was because she did not authorize the foreman to hire me. So I worked from sunup to sundown and didn't get paid. That tore up my spirit. And from that moment on, I decided that I was gonna become a lawyer. And I was gonna use every ounce of strength within me to fight against injustice, regardless of how powerful the opponent is. I am a man that worked my way up from nothing. I know what it means to feel like you're being unfairly treated, and I'm the person that can stand up to opponents regardless of how big or how powerful they are. Welcome to this episode of Legal Hangul with Emmanuel the Law Oluwale. And this recording of this episode is very, it's a very special one because I'm at the crib headquarters in Atlanta and I'm interviewing the one and only Michael Mogo. He's the CEO of Crisp. He's also an author. He's also a podcaster himself. He is the man that makes moguls out of attorneys. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for doing this. And today we're going to be talking about your book. Okay. The Game Changing Attorney. You know, I read this book a while back, and I have to tell you, it's one of the best marketing books I've ever read. Thank you. Well, written, easily digestible, and it's straight to the point. So what inspired you to write this wonderful book? Yeah, so I mean, so now looking back, because the book came out you know, several years ago, I think it came out in, uh, I think it was October of 2018. And around that time, what I realized was that, you know, when Crisp and the way we work with firms, whether we're producing videos or doing marketing or the, or the coaching side, it, I wanted a way to make all the insights and the things that we'd learned more accessible to people overall. So they didn't have to necessarily work with us, um, whether it was somebody in law school or someone just starting their law firm, to be able to learn these different, you know, the, all the lessons in terms of like growing your practice, standing out and differentiating your firm, um, how to build a brand, all of the different case studies that we feature different lawyers throughout the book. I just wanted to make that more widely accessible. And it just, again, it didn't require having to work with us. You could just read the book and that could empower a lot more people. So that, that was really the goal behind the book of putting everything we'd learned um, up until that point uh, from a marketing standpoint into a book and then distributing it both in like paperback, hardcover, ebook, audible. And it's, it's really very, very powerful. And for a lot of people out there who are listening to this who don't know who Michael Mogul is, can you tell them who you are? Yeah, so, so we run a company called Crisp, and we're a law firm growth company. So what that means is that you know, we, we do several things. We started with videos, we're producing videos from law firms to help them stand out and differentiate. And these are videos that can be used online or even run as you know, TV commercials. They're almost like movie trailers for, for people who haven't seen them. Then we expanded, we, we learned that you, know, you can stand out and differentiate, but ultimately you've got to get your message out there. So that's where we expanded to the marketing side, which is really very brand focused of like, how do you get known? How do you get attention? And we help place content on social platforms like Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram. And then we learned, and this is interesting how these lessons were happening. If I could go back, I'd probably do this in reverse. 
but we realize that if you've got a great video and that helps you differentiate and stand out, and then if you're marketing and you're getting that content out there, the phone's going to ring, you're going to start to get known, but then if you don't know how to answer the phones or you don't have a great team or you're just struggling from an operational standpoint, then that's going to create the next problem and that's where really where we expand it to the leadership coaching and coaching law firm owners and their teams on how to build great cultures, how to attract the right people to your organization and really how to run the type of organization that gives you the freedom to focus on the things that you enjoy doing and ultimately love doing, helps you make money and ultimately are your sweet spot in terms of your skill set. So all three are necessary but I can tell you the reason why I say I kind of looking back in hindsight it may have made sense to do it the other the opposite direction is that if you're already working at capacity, if you're working 80 hours a week, 100 hours a week, if you're already spread thinly and you're stressed out and exhausted, I think the last thing that you need is more marketing, right? I mean, it's just if you get the phone to ring more, you get more leads, you get more cases, but you're already working 100 hours a week, you need to find a way, to, you don't need necessarily more to do, you need a way to get more done and to expand your capacity before you know firing up the marketing engine. Yeah, thank you. People see where you are right now, but it took you a while, a journey to get here. You know, first of all, you know, your parents are from Europe. Yeah. You are also a first generation immigrant. What was it like for you uh, moving here at the age of four with your family and growing up in an immigrant home? So, so at first, I didn't know any different. And, and as a child, I mean, it's in your, you know, so my family and I, to your point, we immigrated here. I was four years old. My brother was one. It was like two parents, two grandparents that came here. Uh, my dad was an engineer and my mom was a nurse, but their degrees didn't transfer. So they had to start over. My dad became a, an auto mechanic. My mom's a hairdresser. They didn't speak the language, she had to learn English. In many ways, English is, is, is somewhat my second language. But growing up, I mean, I didn't know any different at first because you're just a kid. And I'm I, you know, very fortunate to have supportive parents. But as I, as I entered the school system, I soon learned that I was not like the other kids. I mean, I was the one that you had to drive in from you know, just out of town, like it was like an hour each way to bring me in. You know, the other kids kind of lived in those same communities. I grew up in low-income housing. Um, I can say that just financially we were not well off, but, but I had my parents' love and I had their support and they valued education and, and all those things that I think were ultimately the most important things. Uh, so it, it was challenging from probably a financial standpoint, but I, I do think hunger is a powerful thing. And, I, and, I, and now having two children of my own, I can say that it's one of those things that you don't want to, uh, it, it becomes an advantage later in life to, to grow up and not have every single opportunity and not have every single advantage because you learn certain skills and resiliency and, and ultimately just having a greater perspective. So I look back and I say I'm extremely fortunate for my upbringing uh, because today it makes me much more grateful and appreciative. And then also, I mean, Emmanuel, to, I, I know you, you share this experience too. It, what opportunity exists in this country? I mean, I could never in a million years do what I'm doing today in America, in, you know, in Russia, where I was born. I mean, if, if I tried anything that I'm doing here in America, the answer would be no over there. The, it just the story would end right there. And just to even have the opportunity, I mean, we didn't come over here with much and, you know, ultimately we didn't have much money, we didn't have any family here, it was first generation, like all, all these things, but this opportunity is still there and it's, obviously it's possible. Hmm, it is, and as they say, USA, you start all over. And that's what your dad had to do. At some point, I think he got a gig. He was painting. He had to paint. Yeah. Can you tell us that story? Yeah. And so how that impacted you. So, so my father, at the time, of course, we didn't have much money. So he was doing all sorts of odd jobs in the in the apartment complex that that we were living in at the time. They had a, a swimming pool, but they needed to like repaint this pool. And my dad volunteered to paint the pool, and they told him they'd, they'd give him I think twenty dollars. It's like pre-inflation to, to paint this entire swimming pool, which you know, for twenty dollars. I mean, I, I guess they got a great value out of it. But I mean, he was willing to do whatever you know, whatever it took. And I remember I still have this photo in my office. But once you know, once he painted the pool, they filled up the pool with water. My family and I, we, we were able to get in the pool. My mom, my dad, my brother, and I, and it was just a great experience. I mean. You know, we were living, in, in our view, at that point, that was the American dream. I mean, it, again, we, you know, you hear, like, stories of how great America is. And I remember when we first got here, I remember my mom saying things like, you know, we thought that this was the, the pit stop on the way to America. Because when we arrived, it, you know, it wasn't a great situation. I mean, my parents were skipping meals just so my brother and I could eat. And, but at the same time, it was, we were refugees and we were escaping religious persecution. And, and to have the opportunity that we did, I, I will say this, something that I've, I now reflect on a lot where I sometimes say like the immigrant mindset and to me the immigrant mindset is one of this delayed gratification. I think this is something immigrants do extremely well because my parents when they came over here to America 
they basically decided and said that, hey, everything is going to be about tomorrow. Everything is going to be about the future. Let's invest in our children. And they were not reaping any of those benefits for years and, and year, decades. And everything was always about the future. But that's obviously, I mean, that's paid off. But it's just, I see so many immigrants, that the thing that I find that distinguishes so many of them outside of just work ethic and, and grit and so on, is just this idea of delayed gratification where they can put away money today and tomorrow and for years and not have to live, you know, that, that glamorous lifestyle to be able to build a great future. Yeah, they invested in you and the investment paid off. And at the age of 13, you decided that you wanted to start your home business. Yeah. And you started in the room of your mom or your parents. Tell us what you did. Yeah, so I, I would say in, in some ways I was born uh, like 10 years too late. You know, I think that because because I, I think back to this time and this is where like the dot com boom was taking off. And I was I mean, I loved computers. My dad at, at the auto shop, he had a client, I think that one of his clients worked for Microsoft and he was able to get my dad like a laptop and it didn't have really any software installed on it but my dad like you know he brought the laptop home and I just became obsessed I would go like into like file systems and I like click through and like I mean there were no, there was no games no programs on this thing but I just was so obsessed with this and then eventually as you know the, the internet and, and just the World Wide web started uh, websites became a thing and this is back in the days where initially you have to code everything in HTML. And before I had a computer, I'd go to the library. I bought this book on, or not bought this book. I rented this book on, uh, checked out on, uh, on HTML. And I would like do the exercises in my head uh, just because I didn't have a computer. But then as soon as I got one, you could open up a text editor and start coding HTML. And this is back in the day with like, you know, websites were fairly basic. I mean, there were really no web standards. So it was like, you'd have like background music and like animated GIFs and you know, all, all sorts of things. But now businesses needed websites, so I started what was essentially a web design company. And I had a few clients at the time. I didn't realize that this was kind of unusual for a 13 year old, but I, I just I was doing it for me. And then um, you know my mom was cutting hair, and she had, she knew somebody that uh, I think had a, a company called Georgia Tutoring, and they would tutor kids. So they needed a website, and I remember they'd come over to our house. I'd sit down with them, I like kind of like map out their website, then I'd code the website, and then you know they'd pay me. And you know, looking back in hindsight, I mean, this was an insane amount of money for a 13-year-old kid. And I, again, I just didn't think anything of it because I was just having fun. I, I thought this was amazing. Now looking back, I think it is interesting. You know, I have a 13-year-old, your mom and dad, let, you know, your clients in the front door, and you sit down, you like, you're coding websites. But that was in many ways the first business. Yeah, that was the beginning of you. And at some point too, you decided to go to medical school. Yeah. You actually took the MCAT and you did very well. Yeah, so happened. so it, it's funny you say I decided to because you know when you're when you're the son of uh, Jewish immigrants you, you've got limited career options it's it's doctor or lawyer Water. and so it, it was and I and I understand why I mean in in many ways like you know people view those careers as like a very like that is a solid it's a solid foundation you will be successful like go get that you know advanced schooling uh, I spent a lot of time just shadowing a lot of doctors, spent hundreds of hours like working with physicians. I took the MCAT, I got into med school, but it just being very entrepreneurial in nature, the more and more time I spent with doctors, the more I realized that perhaps this isn't, isn't really what I love and what I'd love to spend my time doing. I think one of the most courageous decisions I made at the time, which again, I didn't, you, you never know where things will go. So this looked very foolish, you know, for, for everybody around me, especially to my parents, was that I got into medical school, but I put in for a deferral, and I said basically it's like before I go, I want to take a year, and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but this is kind of my way of internally, my gut instinct saying, don't go to medical school because if had I gone, I, you know, you're kind of stuck down that path. You take on a lot of student loans, and then you, you got to either finish or you're just saddled with debt. So I ended up. Uh, this is back in, in 2008. Then the market collapses, and I go from a basically an honors graduate. Um, who was going to go to medical school to washing dishes at a dive bar, which is a place called Taco Mac. It's like a Buffalo Wild Wings, basically. And my parents at the time thought that they just had failed entirely. Right? Like, I mean, all this sacrifice, coming to America, uh, we invest in, in, this, in this guy. He, uh, he takes the MCAT, he gets in, he's supposed to go to medical school, and now our son is, uh, is washing dishes at, you know, at, 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 you know, at a dive bar. And I remember my mom, when she'd have like, clients, uh, she was cutting their hair, and they'd ask about me. Um, they were they were just like what happened to him you know he was going in such a good direction like what what took place and so that led from me washing dishes at Taco Mac to then uh, I got a job at the CDC the Centers for Disease Control washing lab equipment um, and then from there I was able to actually with with my web design background uh, I there was an opportunity to work in like the user experience side of CDC.gov so I did like 
essentially making websites accessible to those screen readers, the blind, like people with disabilities, so how to make those websites usable for them where they couldn't use you know, just web browsers normally. So that's what I did at the CDC. And then from there I bought a camera because I thought it'd just be a good hobby, like just a, a skill to learn of how to take pictures and I've taken pictures of like plants and flowers and you know and landscapes and things like that. And for me, my life, my hobbies have become more than hobbies. So the so the camera and the photography became a photography business. The photography business became you know a photography and video business. Then that expanded to a focus on corporate clients. Then ultimately, I, I started Crisp, which was mostly corporate clients at the time, and then we eventually pivoted to, to law firms only. Yeah. And when you started Crisp, you started at the back of the dentist office. What was that like? Yeah, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's funny, as, as you're asking these questions, I'm like thinking back, like, this is such a, uh, what a path, right? Because at no point was it like, all right, I made it, right? It's just, it, each, each side looks kind of sad when you think about it. It's like, it, there, there wasn't like this glamorous step that took place. It was always like this, this humble step. So when I was starting uh, CRISP, I, a colleague of mine who was a dentist, he was just opening up a, a dental practice. He had built out like most of the practice, but there was a room that he was going to later build out into an operatory when they expanded. But until then, he said, you can use this room as essentially a closet. And that became my first office. So I, you know, I went across the street. There was like, a, I think, an office depot or an office max, uh, bought a desk, bought a chair, and then that was CRISP. So every morning I would come in. They, they were smart. They operated their practice uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Like this was a smart dental practice because you got to think many people want to go when they want you know to get a dental cleaning or dental work before work or after work, right? So I you know I remember getting there early. I'd walk through. They're like drilling in people's mouths. I go back to my office in the back, and then in the evening I'd stay late so I'd lock up the place. You know I'd, I'd close it up for everyone. But that's what it was. And at no point, I will say this, like even in that moment, I was just so excited and so grateful. Like I never had an office before. I wasn't thinking, you know, oh, it's not a cool office or whatever it is. I didn't care. I was just grateful to have, a, you know, some, some sort of place where I could, you know, call an office. So I was just excited and grateful the whole time. I never, you know, in, in my life thought, I and mean, sometimes people ask me, they're like, yeah, but that wasn't very glamorous. You know, I didn't care. I was just excited to even have the opportunity because my thought was always that, if this doesn't work, maybe I got to go to medical school. So this, <laughs> let, me, let me see how far I can take this. You knew who you were. Yeah. And interestingly, you know, even when you started Crisp, it took you a while to get your first gig. Yeah. Because I remember reading the book, you were rejected about 21 times. And you called your dad, and your dad was, told you to go back to medical school. I understand how your parents felt. How did you feel? Did you feel like you disappointed them? Uh, so I wasn't sure. For, for me, in many ways, it, it was. It, I looked at it from the perspective of, and I know today maybe society's a little bit different, but for me, giving up was not an option because what that meant. I mean, yes, I had loving and supportive parents who probably, in a worst case scenario, would have taken me back in and let me live in their home. But it, as I'm sure you know, when your family sacrifices everything, moves you know to to a completely new country, gives up their lives to to give you an opportunity. I mean, the last thing you're going to do is come come crawling back, right? So I would have sooner like you know slept in my car, or, you know, or, or you know, slept in the street before coming back to my parents. So I had to find a way. To me, failure really was not an option. And it, back then, I mean, you know, when we talk about like failing 21 consecutive times, these weren't emails. I mean, these weren't like phone calls. Like I would do full in-person presentations to meet with someone. I was telling them, you know, I've got this video company talking about the power of video. In 2012, this was obviously a very different landscape. Video. You know, YouTube and, and Facebook and these platforms weren't as video you know, centric, and, and people weren't consuming video content primarily on, on the internet. So most people, you know, their response was, "Well, I don't really know why I need a video," or "I don't want to run a TV commercial," because in that case, they'd go to like a big agency. Uh, but they just, I saw that online video was just the future. I mean, I thought it's it's how people are going to consume content. It was a lower barrier to entry for many small business owners who couldn't afford to, you know, run commercials on TV and things like that and produce, you know, content that's, you know, that they would run on more traditional mediums. So I was like, this is this is where everything is going. And you can kind of see the writing on the wall. But back then, 21 consecutive businesses told me, you know, get out of here, right? Like hell no. And then it wasn't until the 22nd, which became a lucky number for me, that I finally got a yes. And again, not glamorous. It was an agricultural company. So they, you know, I, I spent months just traveling across farms all across America and, you know, we were filming, you know, peanuts and, you know, and the different crops and, and things like that. And, you know, and that in itself is a very unique experience. But 
they gave me an opportunity. I was extremely grateful, and you know, and again, that was also really close to. I mean, how many times can you can you get told no? But now I look back and I say, well, maybe you know, maybe if it was someone told me no forty times, maybe my lucky number would be forty one. You know, I who knows? But who knows? <laughs> it, it, you just you just keep going and. I did call my dad. I think it was I don't remember, I don't remember exactly. I mean, it was like thirteen or after thirteen or sixteen no's. I called my dad uh, just to tell him how I was doing, and he was like, "Man, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't think this is for you. I, I think the I think you should go back to you know to you know to the thing you've got here, which is uh, which is medical school. Because but I get it too now as a parent myself. Like you don't want to see your kids struggle. It's not that they don't believe in your dream. It's just really in the sense that they don't want to see you you know struggle endlessly. And to them at that time, I was abandoning what would seem like a sure thing for something that you really has a very indefinite future. I'm down to almost no money. I'm consistently getting rejected. There's really no light at the end of the tunnel. So, you know, what's a parent to say? Yeah. And eventually when you find the light at the end of the tunnel, it wasn't that easy. On the way there, you picked up a traffic ticket. Yeah. And on the way back. Yeah. Yeah. That last night, I mean, it was, it was almost like... I feel like I've ignored the universe in many ways of like whatever message was supposed to be shared with me, maybe I was just being too stubborn. I mean, I remember I was already, you know, already down to just like a few hundred dollars that I had in my bank account. And on the way there, because, I mean, to get to Leesburg, Georgia, which is where the agricultural company was, and I came from Atlanta, so driving there was several hours. I had to leave very early in the morning. Uh, you know, I... I guess this is with the end of the month, there was a lot of like just traffic stops or like just speed traps or what have you. I'm not like some crazy speeder, but I got a ticket on the way there. I was already just like, you know, obviously upset because that ticket to me may as well have been, you know, like just, it weighed a thousand pounds because when, when you're down to a few hundred bucks and you get a speeding ticket, it's like you're almost down to zero. And then after the meeting with the agricultural company to see if, you know, if ultimately I could gain their business, um, they said, great, you know, thanks for meeting with us. We'll let you know in a few weeks. On the way back, I get another ticket. And that one just crushed me. I think at that point, I was pretty close. I, I was like, you know, you're, you're, when you're down into the, you know, uh, like in boxing, when you're in like the 12th round and the, you're like, you, you keep taking punches, you're like, how many more, right? So maybe, you know, maybe I should go back to medical school. But very fortunately, um, you know, a few weeks after that, you know, the agricultural company called me and, and they said, that's it, we're going to move forward with you, which was just, you know, which was kind of that first light. I just need a boost. You are like Rocky, you never gave up. And eventually, you know, your big break came when you got this big contract with this soda company. Yeah. You know, and they wanted to come to see your operations and you pulled it off. Tell yeah. us how you did that. Yeah, so I say soda company in the book. It was Coca-Cola, uh, which I don't know. I mean, I guess at this point, like, you know, we're, we're far enough away from it to where, you know, if, but then by the way, every agency in Atlanta was working Coca-Cola in some capacity. And I remember that we had an opportunity to work with them. When I say we, it was just me and my business at the time. But when I was presenting to Coca-Cola, I wasn't going to say, hey, it's just me. I'm just, you know, just one person. Uh, because I didn't imagine it was possible to get their business when we're competing against other, uh, other creative agencies at the time. And they said, okay, I mean, everything you've shared with us looks great. We think, you know, this could be a great opportunity, but we'd like to just come by and see your operation, maybe meet your team. And, at, you know, I had no operation and I had no team. But at the time, we'd moved out of the dental office, and I, I, I leased this small space. It was, it was less than a, a thousand square feet, and it was an old uh, State Farm office. So when I knew they were coming by, I reached out to a few of my friends, and I said, guys, I need your help. I need you to come in. Coca Cola's going to come in and meet with us, but I need you to come in and just like sit by these computers and just act like you're working. And I didn't even have computers. I had to go to the Apple store, and I, I put a bunch of IMAX on my credit card. So when they, you know, essentially, my friends came in, they sat at these computers. We couldn't even afford the, the software, like, like Adobe Premiere and so on. I couldn't even afford to put it on the computers. So what we did was like, I took a screenshot of the screen and we made the background of the wallpaper that the software, so it looked like they were working in the software, um, when in reality it was just, it was just the, the background. And I remember when the, when the team Coca-Cola came in, they walk in, um, they see like our, our, our team in quotes working on these uh, iMacs and they're so dialed in, they're like, man, like everyone's so focused here, so quiet. It's like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, we got, you know, working on a ton of projects and everything looked great. And they said, all right, wonderful, let's move forward. Uh, it ended up being a, a project for the uh, FIFA World Cup at the time. And as soon as they walked out the door, I'm not even kidding, it must have been like three seconds after. I said, all right, guys, pack up these IMAX. We're, we're bringing them back to the Apple store because I'd maxed out my credit card just, just trying to get them. So that was, um, that was probably one of our more high, high profile clients very early on. 
but in, in, in some respects, like, you know, we had to fake it to, you know, to make it. I know some people say, oh, no, you don't have to do that, but companies like Coca-Cola, they just won't take you seriously if you say, hey, you know, it's just, it's just me, I know support, like, you got this big initiative that's a, a worldwide campaign, um, why should you give me an opportunity? But I think the most important thing is being able to follow through on that commitment. So once we got their business, I was willing to do whatever it took to, to operate the highest standard, and, and we worked with them for several years. Oh, great. What you did was just you improvise on your branding, yeah. and it worked. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you started doing videos for lawyers. How did you pivot into just doing videos for lawyers and law firms? So this happened by accident. I, I will say that, you know, in a lot of the work that we were doing, so when, in the early days of Crisp, we were working with a lot of big agency clients, whether it was Coca-Cola or Verizon or Red Bull, and, you know, just doing these, these big type of agency projects. But on the one hand, like you're working with committees and they have to spend their budgets. So to some extent, I didn't feel like we were really making a, a tangible impact in, in people's lives. So I, I really gravitated to, towards small business because I was also a small business owner and I felt that we could just make a bigger difference. But legal happened by accident in that we had a, a lawyer. She came to us. She was a phenomenal attorney, but she really had no online presence. And we produced a series of videos for her. You know, put them online. Her her business started to grow tremendously. We did it for another lawyer and another lawyer. And I didn't know anything about the legal industry at the time. But as I learned more and more, I started to realize here's a super saturated, super competitive industry where consumers have a very difficult time telling one apart from another. You have some players that have tremendous resources and can do things like TV, radio, and billboards. But the majority, the really great lawyers, oftentimes. Uh, just they don't have the, the financial resources to compete against the major market advertisers. So what are they to do? And yet these are the same lawyers that care so deeply about their communities and they care for their clients. So I saw that the work that we were doing was helping these great attorneys stand out and differentiate. And we've said that the best cases go to the best marketers, which is an unfortunate truth. But what we, you know, our, our vision at the time was to help the, you know, the best cases go to the best lawyers. So in order to do that, we had to make the best lawyers, the best marketers too. We wanted those two things to be one and the same. And you know, and as we got more and more focused, and I certainly learned, you know, just the power of like really having a niche focus and being dialed in. Instead of doing 18 different types of like industries and like, different types of projects, we focus primarily on the legal industry, and and that's never changed since. I mean, that's been 100% of our focus. Um, I will say that it's you know, it, it wasn't even so much. The law firm owners that I think drew me to them, it was their clients. Mm -hmm. I think I saw people like you know like like my, my parents and people who needed like just great legal representation just didn't know who to call or who to reach out to, and this was a way to be able to not just level the playing field, but to be able to support more of those people and more of those types of communities. So I think in many ways we did this for the clients of the lawyers because I just so lawyers are important. I mean this, the the work that law firms do is tremendously important. That the you know. Just being able to provide justice to individuals to support somebody in their time of need. I mean, you know, I know in society sometimes people may may argue that they don't like lawyers, but when you need a lawyer, you know, <laughs> that perspective quickly changes. Exactly. And then, you know, in the book, you describe yourself as a third party observer in the legal industry yeah. who decided to stage an intervention. Why didn't you for the intervention? Well, so it, it, I think back to this, it what I realized is that how, how lawyers believe that consumers were hiring them and how consumers were actually hiring lawyers was sometimes two very different things. So in many ways I saw lawyers who would market almost as if they were marketing to other lawyers, but most consumers really can't tell the difference between one law firm or one lawyer and another. I mean, they just don't really have a great criteria. I mean, maybe they can go off reviews, but if they go to their websites, they see, okay, this one's a super lawyer, but this one's a super lawyer too. This one says they're gonna, you know, fight hard for me. But this one also says they're gonna fight hard. This one says that, you know, they're you know, they're gonna provide aggressive representation. But so does this other lawyer. So they, they can't tell one one good, you know, good lawyer apart from a great lawyer. They just don't know to be to be completely honest. And I mean, who can blame them? So I think that was one one of the reasons why it's so important to differentiate yourself and stand out. But then on the other side, I also saw, you know, this this profession, and, and it was interesting because as this was all happening. I was also, as a small business owner, learning very much the same lessons that we were helping our clients with, because even in my own business, it is just that when they're you know, stressed out, working 100 hours a week, spread thin, exhausted, depressed, I mean, that's not good for anybody. Right? I don't know that you could provide great legal services if you, and I don't know if that's in the best interest of your clients, if you're exhausted, 
and depressed and one foot out the door. So there has to be a better way. And I think it does start with being able to attract great clients and great cases. So that's, you know, that was really the focus of the first book. Yeah. And, you know, and what you did work with people because I remember you going to the conference to speak and you're sharing the story of David and Goliath. Yeah. And Goliath actually showed up. Tell us what happened. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's, it's funny how things work because like one of, the, one of the early law firm owners that we worked with was a criminal defense attorney and well, he was in Nebraska and he was basically uh, like, just all of his cases were like, kind of like drug cases, like focusing on, uh, I mean at the time, I know that some of the laws may have changed since, but just like uh, if somebody was trafficking like marijuana and so on, like this was his sweet spot. He actually had a, a, you know, a dialed in niche focus and we worked with him for uh, several years. We helped his business grow tremendously. He became kind of the go-to, like just for his specific practice area, the go-to lawyer in, in Nebraska. And I remember presenting his case study a year later at this other legal conference and in the room was his biggest competitor who as it's part of his case study, I shared that we pulled away a lot of market share from his biggest competitor. So his biggest competitor comes up to me and says, hey, I'm the guy you mentioned in that story who was losing all that market share. And I'm, he's like, yeah, that happened. Um, and he's like, but now that, you've, now that you've helped Dan, can you help me? And I, you know, I, I reached out to Dan. I was like, Dan, it's, it's up to you. Like, if, if you're not comfortable with this, we won't do it. And Dan's like, no, it's great. Like, we focus on very different things. Like, this is someone who focused on veterans law, uh, and they also focused on personal injury. We, we, in many times, he refers cases to me. So we ended up working with Goliath as well. And the two were able to be successful. The two were very close friends, even, you know, even to this day. So it was, in many ways, kind of an interesting story. And, and then the following year after that, Goliath's on stage, you know, presenting his case study. <laughs> that was wonderful. And then eventually, now you also, you just don't make great videos only, you also coach attorneys. Why did you decide to diversify into not just making great videos, but also training attorneys and coaching them? Yeah, so I, I will say that I think for many years when we were just doing videos, we were doing marketing, those things are very important without a doubt and you help a law firm differentiate and stand out and being able to attract cases and being able to increase their average case value and get the phone to ring. But at the core level, really, it's like if you really want to help someone transform, you have to transform them as a leader. And that's how, you know, that's where all this decision making happens. That's how they have great outcomes. That's how you attract great people into your organization. So I just realized that we can make a much greater impact than just shooting videos and just providing marketing that there was another level of, of impact that we could make in coaching our lawyers to just be great leaders, to build great cultures, to build great teams, to really be able to expand their practice. And then the marketing and the video became really a supplement to that. So that's where we expanded it. It started, I think, in, uh, in 2018. Now, you know, we work over a thousand firms and ended up being like just probably one of the most transformational things we, we've done because we were able to reach so many more people and help them in so many more ways. When you realize that, you know, marketing is wonderful, but building a great business really comes down to you being able to effectively lead yourself, you being able to assemble a great team, you being able to have a great culture that attracts the right people into that organization. And then as a result of that, you can start to get time back because now you have a team, you have support, you no longer have to work 80 to 100 hours a week and life just becomes much more enjoyable because you're not doing it all alone. Mm -hmm. So it was just about making an impact on a higher level. That's awesome. And every year you have this Game Changers Summit and it keeps getting bigger, bigger and wilder. What inspired you to start in the first place? Yeah. So. So the shortest version of this, we have this law firm growth comms, we call it the Game Changers Summit. We've now done, I believe, uh, we're on a fourth or fifth one. Uh, this year, I think we'll be the fifth one. And it, the, so it started because originally, back in 2017, we decided to give a car away. And we gave it away at a, at a legal conference. And you know, it, was, it was a huge hit, so much so that we decided to do it again to, for our clients in 2018. But this time... It happened after Super Bowl Sunday. There was like nine people in the room. We were at this legal conference. It was very anticlimactic. We called out the winner. They weren't even there. They weren't even in the room. They weren't even in that state. Um, so I just looked and I said, look, this is the last time we give our grand prize away at another legal conference. Why don't we just host our own? And that's what led to the Game Changers Summit. But it was also not just that reason. It was the fact that at the time, there was a lot of great legal conferences focusing on trial skills and just being, being a great lawyer. But there weren't as many focusing on being a great leader, being a great marketer, and really just the business side of law that we wanted to do a conference. And, and I also, no disrespect to any other legal conference, because I, I know there's a lot of great ones, but I attended many conferences where I'd see people on their laptops, you know, 
they're falling asleep on the back. They got a speaker on stage. No one's paying attention. I was like, there's just got to be a better way. We got to make this exciting. We have to make it the type of uh, of conference where you could not sit there on your laptop checking emails. We got to make it like you got to have great speakers. Let's make you know great production. We've got a DJ. We've got great sound. Like you have great food. Like we just let's just make it an experience. And then you give people a reason to pay attention. And then since the first one, I mean, the first one was around 500 people. The last one back in uh, November of last year was around 5,000 people. I mean, they've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that's mo mostly a testament to the fact that people like this stuff. I mean, they, they want to go to something like that. I mean, if they didn't want to go, they wouldn't show up, right? So that, that tells me that this was something that was missing in the, in the legal industry. Yeah. And you give away just luxury cars. Why Teslas? Why it bands? Yeah. Why? So, so the short answer is we give, we give away cars because it's, you know, I think it's important to get people excited and I don't know if like, you know, Toyota Camrys and, and, uh, and a Prius would get someone excited. Like it, a lot of this stems from the fact that, you know, you've got an industry that is very traditional by nature. Um, yet I find that the actual, the, the lawyers themselves, like they want to be entertained, they want to be engaged, they want to have a great time, they want to learn, and, like, but, and I find you actually learn better when you are engaged and you, and you are uh, inspired and you're excited. You could present the same information to someone in, in a completely different format and they, you know, they won't remember any of it, it won't be a transformational experience versus you put them in an environment where, you know, I always say like, no one wants to go to Disney World virtually, mm -hmm. right? Like you want to be there and that's, that is an experience you'll never forget. And, that's, and that was our approach as well. So with the cars, it was, on the one hand, we wanted to get our clients excited. We wanted to give them something that you could you know, aspire to. And I don't know if it was always just the cars that, that did it, but I don't think it hurts. And, and then also, we, you know, selfishly, we, we needed a way to get our name out. I mean, when we were starting out, even with the first conference back in, uh, in 2018, you know, we were such a small company. It was, most organizations had more resources than us. Most legal conferences have been around for 20 years. I mean, no one really heard of us. We needed a way to get attention, and it, and it, you know the, the car was one way to stand out. And when people heard about this, they'd say, "What you know? What's this? Who who's Chris? But like, what are they giving cars away?" And they'd hear about this stuff. And even if they didn't like us, I mean, they could dislike us. They could say, "I don't like Michael. I don't like Chris." But they were still talking about us. And if they were talking about us, other people were getting to know us. And then ultimately, those people eventually found out about us and would either attend the event or, or read the book or you know listen to the podcast or something. But we just you know. Again, coming from humble beginnings, we needed a way to get noticed. The way you dream is so incredible because you dream so huge. Last year, you had that conference at, at the stadium. That's the 55,000 capacity. Yeah. What led you to dream that huge? What inspired that? Yes. It's mind-blowing. So every year when we go into the conferences, we always try to have like a theme. And like a theme in mind, we've had things like never complacent and... Um, lead yourself and no courage, no progress, you know, just different themes for the different events because we want to have a message that carries through that we hope is going to be inspirational and transformational for someone because our goal was always that someone, we want to make it more than an event. Like we wanted to be able to, someone to attend and learn a lot, but our goal is that somebody can come out of there and just be a transformed person that, that, that inspires them for the next year to either recommit to their business or their family or their health or, you know, or whatever it is that it was just, it was more than just some two-day event or some two-day conference that it made a meaningful impact. And as we were going into the Mercedes event, so before we booked the venue, one of the big things that I, I kept talking about internally with the team was just that, you know, the idea of how people learn or how people, you know, what, how they change, if they change. And, you know, having young children, I, I looked at everything and I was like, you know, kids don't listen to the things you tell them. They, they just, they base it on what you do and things are, are caught, not taught. And I, you know, I kept saying this thing, I was like, when you see someone do something, it just means more than when someone tells you something. And then I was like, you know what, like we could talk about growth and we could talk about dreaming big, but I, it's one way you do that message, you know, at a, at, a, at a small, you know, like a Motel 6. It's another thing if you do it at Mercedes-Benz football stadium where they play the Super Bowl. And it's like, if you're going to tell people to dream big, then let's have a venue that encapsulates that. So that was the idea of just showing that, like, you know, basically... You know, if you see someone do something, it means more than someone just telling you something. And I felt that one of the best ways to inspire others was to was to do that ourselves and to be an example of it. Exactly. And that's exactly what you wrote in this book. You said, get uncomfortable. That's the only way to do something groundbreaking. Yeah. And that's what you did. Yeah. Wow. And then you have your chief strategist, mm -hmm. Jessica Mogul. Mm -hmm. Tell us about her. 
So Jessica, in many ways, deserves more of the credit for all this than, than I do because I was just, I don't really love this term because when people say like visionary, but I guess that's what I was in the sense that I have very limited skills. I mean, yes, I, I have, you know, I could have some ideas, but ideas really aren't worth much without great execution. And I love sales and marketing, but when, you know, when Jessica stepped into the business, and this was early on, this was, I think, in uh, 2013, 2014. Chris was a mess, right? I didn't know anything about anything. I, I'd never taken a single business class, marketing class, sales class, finance class. So my team was, you know, really just a disaster. Um, I, it, my doing, right? So I didn't, uh, we didn't have any sort of like training and development. We didn't have a hiring process. We didn't have any operations in the business. And I was just frustrated. I could work hard. I think that was my saving grace in the sense that I had, I had grit and I could put a lot of hours in. So that took us, you know, to, to a certain point but we could have never gotten to that next level had it not been for Jessica. And, and when Jessica and I met, she was working as a uh, as like a consultant, and consulting businesses across the country. She was a, an engineer by you know by trade. She went to school with like full full scholarship engineer. Uh, I don't know what she you know saw in me because when we met, like w just, this was in the ground floor of Chris. We didn't have anything. I was broke. Um, she was actually doing very well in, in in her career. I asked her if she'd come in for thirty days just to help me put some processes in place because. I was being as, as vulnerable as I could be. I was saying that essentially I have no idea what I'm doing. And she came in and 30 days has turned into you know, almost a decade now. But she was basically the, you know, the execution piece behind all of this. She was able to get the team together, the hiring process, attract the right people, provide the right, you know, just operational structure, like all the SOPs, just making sure that we could take an idea and make it real. So I always say like the idea is the easy part. You know, that's maybe 1%. It's how do you make it repeat and recur and how do you do it right? And, and Jessica was the glue that made that happen. But we had very complementary skill sets. Like she didn't, she didn't like the, the sales and marketing piece or the visionary piece. She liked you know, to be able to work behind, you know, back of house. So we just worked very well together. I'm very fortunate in that respect. And then um, you know, several years into that, I said, look, I got to lock this in. So I asked Jessica to marry me. Now we've got two young girls, uh, so it's it's worked really well. I mean, I'll say that for for both of us, it's it's something that's paid off. I will also say very you know very fortunately, the this can work for some people and it, maybe not for others. I think it just depends on your relationship and the the skill sets. Because sometimes people ask me like, hey, what's it like working with your wife? Well, on the one hand, we're working on very different things because we're working in different areas of the business. But two, like I think it's there's really no one you can trust more. I never had to explain anything to her. I never had to explain why we were working late. I mean, she was right there with me. We were coming in on you know Saturday and Sunday every week for years, and it just having someone there that just that doesn't ask you to do less or says, "Hey, take it easy" or, or whatever it is that just supports your vision and helps you move forward rather than just kind of being an anchor in some ways. I think is uh, it's probably one of the best decisions I made. Wow, that was wonderful. We share the same values. Yeah. yeah. So, what do you have to say to attorneys who are out there on the fans? And they're like, why should I let non-lawyers coach me? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, so I think about this a lot in the sense that I believe that we're pretty close, but maybe you know, we're still a few years away. I actually think the opposite question is probably a more shocking question of like, why would you let a lawyer coach you? Because when you think about it, and I say this respectfully, that a, a lawyer's education by nature, even when they go to law school, is in the practice of law. So you know, it's, it's generally not in business, it's not in marketing, it's not in leadership, it's not in these skill sets. That one would think, I mean, I, I look back and think, you know, who, who do I really aim to learn from? And when we were building the video company, it wasn't somebody running a video company. When we were building the marketing company, it wasn't somebody running a marketing agency. And certainly as we were growing the coaching side of the business, it was never another coaching company. If I wanted to learn about customer service and client experience, I was like, who does this really well? I'd be like, you know, the Ritz Carlton and Disney, right? I wouldn't say, hey, well, you know, if you're a law firm owner, for example, saying, let me learn about customer service from another lawyer. I mean, they're just not known for those specific things. Uh, the other thing I would say is that just, you know, at this point, and it, it doesn't have to be us, but, you know, we have this very unique perspective in that having worked with, you know, over a thousand firms, you can see a lot of trends in just every practice area, every market size, like you just learn a lot about what, you know, what firms are doing to succeed versus what firms are doing that's maybe not as successful. You're not operating off like a sample size of one. And I see a lot of people that, you know, they grow their business and they think, okay, well, this worked for my firm, this will work for every other law firm in America. But in reality, that's, that's just not true. Some things work for certain practice areas that don't work for other practice areas. Some things, some might say, hey, TV's been great for me, but you know, they got into TV advertising 20 years ago when, you know, when, when they were able to lock in very different types of contracts and price points and you know, that exposure was very different then. People really aren't watching TV commercials the same way that they used to you know, 20 years ago. 
It's the same way where I know a lot of our like you know clients that are large traditional advertisers have reallocated their spend from billboards and radio and so on that they're moving it to digital. But but if you were to take some advice and say, hey, I think you should do billboards and in, in radio and those things. In 2023, I don't know. I don't know if that's that what I would recommend to a lawyer starting out. So in some ways, it's not like what got you here will get you there. It's very, very different. So I think it's just important to have a large enough sample size to know what works for different types of firms and different practice areas and different markets and can bring and share those lessons. The other aspect of it is, is that, at least in our experience, it's, it's not even just us. It's this community that you can, you know, that you can basically... Uh, connect with and just become a part of that is so important. Most lawyers that I find that locally, either the local state bar associations, the people that you know attend a lot of the state bar meetings aren't very entrepreneurial in nature. They're kind of like very old school, kind of complaining about, you know, X, Y, Z, why is this person marketing? Why, you know, why is my practice struggling? And then the people that are, let's say, great marketers or great business leaders locally sometimes don't want to share what they're doing. So it's finding communities where how can I be around people that are as entrepreneurial as I am, that like, share similar values that I can learn from, that are, are either where I already want to be and they can share their lessons, or that I can have accountability and support, and that's another part of what we've created. Thank you. And what does it feel like to be the father of two daughters? Oh, that's the best part. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, there's, there's nothing better. I, uh, I will say that you know, two girls is probably fitting for me because... It, 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 it's all ladies in our home, right? It's like Jessica and our, and our two daughters. But it's, I mean, it's the most gratifying thing. And I will say, I used to think that, um, you know, it, you, you always have to, at this point, I've learned that, you know, these kids are a blank slate. Like, when they're born, and it's up to you to make sure that you prepare them for the world. So it's either you prepare them or the world will. And so I take that very seriously. And, and I will say that all the things that took me so long to learn that, you know, that I struggled with, everything from a mindset standpoint, like just all of that, I want to impart those lessons in our daughters so that they can be people of value no matter what they do. I mean, they don't have to be entrepreneurs. They can do whatever they're passionate about. My rule is just that whatever you're passionate about, that you, you go all in and you're committed, right? That you don't doubt, you know, dabble or put your toe in the water, that you are, you do it. What, you know, whether you want to be an artist, you want to be an architect, you you know, whatever it is that excites you, you can try many different things, but, you know, go all in and, uh, you know, and, uh, and do it right. I know you ask everyone this question, so I'm going to ask you, what does being a game changer means to you? Oh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I've asked this question, I don't even know how many times, probably 200 times, and I, I've, I've rarely been asked it. So to me, a game changer is someone who is not afraid to, to challenge the status quo, to do something in a unique way, and ultimately is, is true to themselves because I heard this quote the other day that the fastest way uh, to become unpopular is to be consistently successful. So what that means is also in the sense that if you're going to be an outlier, you're going to do things differently, sometimes there's going to be people that don't agree with it, they may criticize it, they might challenge it, but if you stay true to yourself, you can accomplish some pretty amazing things. And ultimately, I think that's what it's all about in impacting others. Well, thank you. You've been wonderful. And thank you for coming on Legal Angle and talking about the game-changing attorney. And in fact, you've been a wonderful game-changer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those, of, for those of you listening or watching us at home, thank you for joining us. Until next time, take care.